side, we've got some garlic chives that you'll see is actually in a little bit of a smaller tray. This is what we call a seedling size tray. Basically, you also have all the roots floating in the water there. And if you then come through and fall in, Yeah, you'll see, you'll find our two, uh, tomatoes. So this is a method we're calling gravel bed or flood and drain. So if you actually walk through this other side, we actually use a method called the bell siphon to actually let our water go up and down. And you guys will learn everything about it in the course. So this is actually there where we mechanically flood and drain this water. So there's always a constant flow into our bed, but once... But using this, we get a nice up and down because you need the water on the roots to get the nutrients there and you need the water off the roots to get the oxygen in there. So it's very important that's the way we go up and down into this bed. So you can see these tomatoes are about two months old. You've got the kids going around in there. You've got Jacob that's not happy with them in there. Um, but yes. So if we then move from here, we go to the aquaculture side. You follow me? Quickly to show you guys here, but what is very nice about aquaponics and the gravel bed is you can do what we call it a double cropping. I've got my tomato growing here while I've got watercress growing underneath it. A very, very nice way and a very a good benefit of aquaponics is doing this double cropping. You're not wasting a single inch of space in this place. Right. So going to the aquaculture, I'm going to speak louder because there's a lot of water running. I'll show you guys. This is our trout. They need a lot of water flow, a lot of aeration, and everything around that. You guys will learn about it, but this is why it's so loud. So let's go and have a look. Okay, so welcome to the aquaculture side. You can see if you have a look at this uh, tank here. We have a shower where our water comes in. This is there to help cool down our water as well as aerate our water and degas our water. Very nice and very needed for trout. And you'll see in the tunnels there's quite a lot of aeration running around, making sure our fish are happy with all the air in the tunnel. So this is also the highest point in our tunnel. Hey, Carl. From here, Carl. It's gravity fed. Can you guys hear me? Just uh, speak slowly. There's a lot of noise there. And then from the camera, just hold it still because it's buffering a bit. Okay. Sorry, guys. I tend to speak. Oh, sorry, Carl. Now you've been muted. Can you unmute yourself? All right. So I'm just going to stand behind the camera. I presume you can maybe hear me a little bit better then. But basically, this is the first fish tanks on the aquaculture side. We have these showers, which is used for cooling the water, degassing the water. And as you can see, Noah is currently busy feeding the fish. Um, we've got some nice big trout in there. All of them at the average weight of about one kilogram. But basically... This is the aquaculture side. We have five tanks per tunnel. Um, and I hope you guys can still hear me and see me. So moving on to the filtration, quickly show you guys what filtration we are using. We call it, this is our biofiltration. And this is where all the magic happens. This is our Matala mat that's in there. This is where your bacteria actually sits. And actually, your fish waste is converted to plant food. Alright, this is our mechanical filter. You guys will learn everything about it, how it works and everything in the course. Um, and basically, if you go back to the corner of this, you can see the whole aquaculture side in there. Like I said, this is the highest point in our system. From here, everything is gravity fed through our system and back to here, we pump it. Um, so that is a quick farm tour of what our farm looks like. There's some sump, there's the office and the different way. And you can see in this tunnel, 
What we have here is we've got a fish called Fangaceus or Barsa. And one thing you can definitely see, there's a lot less water flow, a lot less air, showing the different requirements for the different fish. Okay. We can go quickly run through this tunnel. This is a very nice tunnel. We've got our spring onions, our lettuce, red lettuce, and everything in here. So this is a tunnel where we only have deep water culture. You can see we've got some very nice baby gem on the right hand side with our red lettuce. Left hand side, you can see some chilies in the back in the front here, some spring onions, as well as some chives. Right. I don't know if there's any questions. I can't see the comments being dropped. So Justin, maybe if there's a question, just let me know. So yeah, this is our spring onions. Okay, cool. Uh, Francis has a, a question for you. Francis, go for it. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so Francis's question is saying trout are cold water fish and Nikki is asking the question, is there a reason you do it so low down? All right. So on the first question with a cold water, yes, trout is a cold water fish. And that's the reason why you saw all the showers and the amount of water flow there that we have to actually keep the water cold. Now there's different, different techniques and everything that goes around it which you guys will cover into the course, but basically that shower is one of the techniques that works very well. And the reason for we didn't see the showers on this, the tunnel we currently are on is because of Pangasius is a warm water fish, so there's no showers needed. Um, so that's the first question. The second question, the reason why these DWCs, I, th I think she's referring to the DWCs that is low, the reason for that is that's all coming back to our gravity flow. So because our fish tanks are on level, on the ground level, we actually have them a little bit, uh, the DWCs and everything, we actually need to have down below so we can get that gravity flow all the way from my fish tanks that's sitting there through my DWCs and back to there. So that's the reason why we have it so down low. You can have it up in the air, but then you'll have to put your, your fish tanks up in the air, which will mean more money. But that is all coming back to your choice. So that's the reason why we are back down into the ground. Yeah, and the, and the, the second reason uh, for all of that is with aquaponics, there's a big balance between uh, pretty and also cost effective. So um, when it comes to, especially in Africa, you need to be smart uh, as to how you design your system. So typical electricity consumption of the, the system you're seeing here, uh, and this system has the capacity to produce over 12,000 heads of lettuce every month, and it's running on one kilowatt of power. And the reason it's only one kilowatt of power is because we're not having to pump our water uh, anywhere except from the final return point up to the the fish tanks so so yeah and those are the things that we cover is how do you um man how do you design your system in the most cost effective way now sinking a dwc into the ground with liner is the cheapest most space efficient way uh you can do it <clears throat> okay uh carl another couple questions for you uh, are tilapia warm or cold um, and how often do you clean the Matala mat? Okay. So tilapia is a warm water fish. They like the warmer waters. Um, then with regards to the Matala, so we did clean our Matala filters once a week. But since we've introduced that mechanical filter, I quickly showed you guys, we are now only cleaning it every third week. Cool. And again, it's, it's one of the, the learning curves, you know, we've, we've had along the way to reduce any manual labor. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, you're keeping trout. What is the ratio of fish to vegetables? And yeah. does the greenhouse maintain temperatures high enough for tilapia or is there other heating required? All right, so the first one with regards to the trout. 
So we actually on this farm, we we work on growing area to um, the actual volume of our fish tanks. So you will see in the in the material that we give you, we go through an example where you actually say how much vegetables you want to grow, and then we reverse that back to how big of an area aquaculture or fish tanks do you need. So that's the ratio of how we work around that to make sure that there's enough nutrients for our plants. But basically, it comes down to that for every eight square meters of growing space, you want one cube of water. So it, I know that sounds a horrible or it sounds very complicated, but basically, you guys will see there's a certain stocking density that you stock your fish, for every type of fish, and that links to then the area of the volume of water you have. So then with regards to the greenhouse, maintaining the temperature high enough for tilapia, it is possible, but it's, it's, you need to make sure then that everything is indoors, inside a greenhouse. For example, your aquaculture and your, um, your aquaculture as well as your hydroponics needs to be in, indoor. Um, but there are techniques to actually keep it warm that is not very, very cost, costly, like geothermals and things like that. But the best way is to put your tanks inside the tunnel, making sure that your, everything stays nice and warm. Uh, we have one of those tunnels. I can actually quickly make my way while we answer another couple of questions to that tunnel where we actually have our fish tanks inside, full of tilapia. All right. I hope that answers everyone's questions. Cool. Oh, I, um, I, found the, cool. I found the question tab, so I can see the questions go as well. <laughs> All right, so Carl's now walking over to one of the smaller uh, greenhouse tunnels on the farm uh, where we're actually growing tilapia. So there's three fish we're growing, tilapia, uh, pangasius, and trout. And each of the fish are in their own uh, environment that is right for the fish and obviously the plants we're growing with it. So you can see the red nilotikus uh, swimming around in the tank there. Uh, very pretty fish, very tasty fish, um, and the biggest difference being the the tanks are actually inside the greenhouse, uh, which does reduce your growing area, but it definitely helps to retain the heat uh, of the system. And Noah's picked a cucumber. <laughs> Yes, guys, so here you can see our fish tanks with tilapia in them, actually within this tunnel. This tunnel you can see is a little bit smaller. We've got our French chives there and some cucumbers, and they have just decided they want to get some cucumbers and ready, so we don't mind, that makes them healthy. So this tunnel will optimally, uh, will run a little bit higher, the water temperature, because everything is inside. We've got nice and big flaps on the top of our tunnels that you can open and close as you would like, as you want to control the temperature. But basically in this tunnel in the winter, it is always closed, making sure our fish are happy, making sure the water is nice and warm. Um, and one thing you guys will also learn is to actually, how do you match your type of fish with your type of crop? Because you'll see this tunnel is full of cucumbers and cucumbers like water that's a little bit hotter. And that's why they go perfectly with our uh, tilapia. Where with your trout, you would much rather go with lettuce and stuff like that because they like it colder. But that all we will cover later on this in the course to understand how do you match crop with fish. Okay. So to answer the question on terms of which best, which is the best fish, trout or tilapia, it all determined, uh, it all comes back to how much nerves you are. How do you, you have nerves of steel? So, it all comes back actually to what is your market? What do you have in the market? And tilapia, tilapia is a much easier fish to farm than trout. You can see the amount of water flow and the amount of air. So it is a, it is a fish that costs less to actually produce and farm with, and they're a little bit more hardy. But your trout is the one that makes a lot of money. But they are very, very sensitive to everything. 
So it all comes back to how involved are you going to be? How sure are you going to be? Uh, how involved are you going to be into that farm, day-to-day farming of the, um, of the fish? So if you're going to be involved very much, I would say trout's a nice fish if you have the market. If you're going to go do trout in Nigeria, you're not going to sell it. But if you go do barbel in Nigeria, you will. So it all comes back to what is your market, what is your market need, and how much time are you going to put into that system? Okay, let me quickly, I see you want to see some fish. Let me quickly get some fish food, and I can actually feed them and show you guys what it looks like. They're very shy today, I see. Probably just been fed. All right. Cool, Carl. I don't know if you want to... I'll take over. If you find a fish net, maybe you can scoop out a fish uh, for... <laughs> yes. for the guy to, to see. I'll sit here. Give me just a few seconds and I'll scoop it. Yeah, it's a little bit, uh, little bit shaky. So again, one of the the beautiful things uh, with aquaponics, um, you can see my son and his friend can pick the product straight from the the system and eat it uh, without having to wash it, without having to to clean it, because um, there are no chemicals or pesticides. On it. Well done. So yeah. Um, it's always a very nice, nice sight to to see. Cool guys, keep the questions uh, coming through um, on on the chat. Uh, next one, what is our preferred water source? So at the farm here, we we are very fortunate to have very good water coming from a borehole. Um, it comes out at a very nice neutral pH. Uh, which is great. It obviously doesn't cost us much money. We don't use a lot of it, uh, which is which is also great. But um, definitely a good, clean borehole, uncontaminated water source is ideal. But uh, if you have access to a river, the key thing with the river is really to make sure that there's no things like E. coli uh, or bad bacteria in the water source purely because that can be transferred onto the crops. Now, with aquaponics being cold-blooded, uh, typically you don't get the bad E. coli uh, and salmonella, things like that, because they don't survive through the fish, uh, but you can introduce it. So being aware of where you get your water and who's upstream, uh, one of the big dangers of, of pulling water from a river is the fact that um, if someone upstream has put a lot of chemicals into the water, there's a good good chance that those chemicals could harm your fish. So it's, uh, yeah, just a, a thing to be wary of if you are using uh, a public water source. The ideal, and there are a number of farms using rainwater where they harvest rainwater and they use that, uh, which also is very effective, works really well. Um, and because you're using so little water, I mean, 95% less water than traditional farming, uh, if you are in a place with good rainfall, obviously rain, rainwater is a good, good option. All right, so um, Thomas, at what size or weight do you harvest your fish and how long does it take to reach their harvest size? Golden question. Um, we harvest our trout, we harvest them at two weights. The one weight is at a kilo, uh, and that is for particularly the restaurant market for fillets, and that takes almost a year for our trout to get to a kilo, and then other markets, we are supplying them in at uh, pan size, 600 grams, which you're looking at about seven, seven months uh, to reach. Now, the tilapia, very dependent on uh, water temperature, same as the pangasius, you can look at anything between six months and 14 months to get them to uh, pan size. 
Okay, it looks like Carl had some fish to show us. Carl? I've got some fish, okay. You know, bring them out, please. So, this is our tilapia. The Nile tilapia. I hope you guys can see nicely. They're jumping all over the place. But basically, these fish are about one to two months away from harvest. They average about, at the moment, about 300 grams, or what would it be, you know? There you go. You know, tell, say hi. Hi, how are you? He's running the aquaculture with us. So this is basically the tilapia. Almost done, ready for all of his things. About as big as my hand. Um, I don't have small hands. So, but yeah. I hope you guys can nicely see. We will quickly run up and go get a pangasius as well as the trout to show for you guys. Cool. Okay. Um, all right. France is asking a question. Do you use hydroxide buffers or carbonates or a combination? So uh, what Francis is referring to here is that uh, pH and controlling pH in aquaponics is actually incredibly important, not only for the fish, but actually for the plants. So we maintain a pH on our farm between 6.5 and 7. Um, and typically we will use hydroxide buffers uh, because they are stronger and cheaper. So something like potassium hydroxide uh, is fantastic for, for buffering up. And in some cases uh, where farms do struggle with high pH, we'll buffer down with uh, nitric acid or phosphoric acid depending on the uh, nutrient deficiencies of that system. But definitely calcium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide are our recommended form of buffering. And if you don't understand, don't worry. Uh, we will definitely cover a lot more detail around that uh, later on in the course. Um, Pierre, what, what's the rate of water renewal? Um, so what I'm reading into here is how often... There's two things. One is with aquaponics, you never, ever change the water. So once the water's in the system, uh, you keep on recycling it forever. Unlike hydroponics, unlike aquaculture, there is no disposing of that water uh, because you're maintaining an equilibrium between the fish and the plants. So all we have to do is put water into the system that is lost because of... Uh, because of uh, uh, evaporation or what the plants are absorbing into the body of that plant and particularly tomatoes and cucumbers hold huge volumes of water. So it very much depends on, on how well covered your system is, what plants you're growing, but typically uh, in a system like one of the systems you saw which is 100,000 litres of water in there, we're looking at maybe adding 1,000 litres, 2,000 litres of water per day. All right, here's another fish. This is the Pangasius, comes from Vietnam. Carl. Hello, guys. So this is the Pangasius. Very nice fish. Family of the catfish. It tastes like a hake. Um, a few years back, Ocean Basket got in trouble. They were selling this for fish and chips. But you won't taste the difference between this one and a hake. Very nice fish. When you want to do something, have a fish that's really simple to actually farm with. They, they're not as finicky as a, as a trout or even a tilapia. Uh, they take about nine months to get to the size. They're about 1.2 kilograms for harvesting. Um, and you can actually see the amount of water flow. It's very little. And you can actually see this is the only amount of air we're putting in here because they actually come to the surface and breathe on the surface. So very nice fish. Okay, let me go to the trout. Cool. Thanks, Carl. Ms. Carl, it's over to the trout. Um, one of the things we are showing you here is it is possible to farm with a variety of fish and understanding the right fish for your environment is incredibly important. Uh, I've seen very often farmers trying to farm a fish in a very cold area that actually just needs warm water and they struggle to, to find the optimum for both. Uh, what we're proving here is in, in Johannesburg, we have very, very hot summers, very, very cold winters, and yet we're able to farm with both tropical fish um, as well as non-tropical fish such as, uh, such as a trout. Um, and the trout definitely, for me, fits in very nicely with the temperatures your plants need to grow. 
So yes, Pierre, you just need to top up water. It is one of the most water efficient methods of farming, uh, of agricultural farming th that exists and blow your mind that you can grow fish at the same time. Um, Andres, is it similar to the Mekong catfish and do you need a permit? Um, all fish in South Africa, you do need a permit to hold those fish. Uh, but it is not uh, classified as an alien invasive, such, you know, like a Nile tilapia. So the permit is, is what they call a release permit. It's actually quite simple to get. Um, is it similar to the Mekong catfish? No, it is not uh, similar to the Mekong catfish. It's a different family of catfish, um, but obviously comes from the same Mekong region. Uh, Jan asking the question, can you use carp or barbel? Um, yes, absolutely. You can use carp or barbel. Um, both are perfectly, perfectly good fish for aquaponics. What do we feed pangaceous? We feed them pangaceous feed. Um, pangaceous feed is very similar to trout feed. So it's, it's, it's very high in, in protein, but you can feed pangaceous, pretty much any tilapia feed or, or trout feed, which is pelletized. Okay, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. in my 100,000 liter system, uh, we are topping up one to 2,000 liters of water per day. Okay, there's those fish going absolutely berserk. Um, All right. Over to you. Okay, here in this tunnel we've got our trout. You can see they're very, very, very going up and down. Let's keep it down here. So yeah, you can see a nice, nice big trout. Um, rainbow trout, very nice fish. I love them the most. Um, they, you get a lot, a lot of money for this one, but it is a lot of more difficult to actually farm this fish. You can see we've got the showers, we've got the aeration running all through this tunnel. Um, so it's a much harder fish to farm with, but it's much better reward. So you must decide are you high risk, high reward, or you low risk, medium reward. All comes back to you and your market. All right. Cool. Thanks, Carl. Okay. Can you guys still hear me? Just give me a quick thumbs up. Okay. Cool. So there's an overview um, of our farm, getting hands on with the fish um, and just allowing you to, to get a bit closer to, to what aquaponics is um, and the potentials of it. I mean, that last trout you saw is, is sold as a salmon trout. Uh, a lot of restaurants use it as a replacement for farmed salmon. It's got the same properties, pink flesh. You can use it in sushi and sashimi. Uh, it, it, it's, it's got a definitely higher value to it, but obviously the market's not as big as, say, for your tilapia or your catfish. Cool. Um, guys, keep uh, the questions coming in. Jan, um, farms located in, in Midrand uh, in President Park, so very close to Santon, but... 10 Ks from, from Santon. Okay, what's the optimal water flow rate between the fish and the grow beds? So very much depends actually on the fish you're farming. So for trout, we are replacing our tank water every hour. So it circulates hourly. Uh, with the uh, tilapia, it's every two hours uh, or every three hours. So the flow rate is dependent on the fish that you're farming. Cool. Any, any other questions? Okay, good question from Nikki. Do we use a sump? Uh, so basically a sump is a space on your um, system where your water gathers before being returned into your fish tanks. Uh, yes, we do use sumps on this farm. Um, most of our systems have a sump, uh, but some of them don't. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both, uh, which is something we'll definitely cover in a lot more detail during the course. 
but our recommendation is is not necessarily to have a sump, but to come up with another way to decouple your fish. Okay, Andres, why don't you see header tanks? Simply, I don't like header tanks at all. Um, I have tried them, I have battled with them, and I completely do not see the purpose or the point unless you want to raise your entire system off the floor, which is going to be very, very costly uh, to do. So the, if you look at it and how our systems are all designed, our fish tanks are the header tank. So uh, what we are using in these systems is our fish tanks being the highest point on the farm is the header tank that flows through to the whole system, which is why you see our, our gravel beds are at one level, our deep water beds are at another level. Now, when it comes to, to operating, you'll see our water beds are extremely large. And the reason they're so large is to optimize space. Okay. What's your airflow rate in trout and tilapia tank? Meters cube per hour per cube of water. So we have a very simple rule. Uh, our trout gets 20 liters of air per minute per cube, um, and tilapia get 10 liters of air per minute per, per meter cubed. Um, that's just to answer the question there from, from Francis. Justin, if I can quickly jump in, I just want to show the guys a little bit the hobby system. They'll can also see we do it in small scale as well. All right, guys, so quickly just here, here's our first type of hobby system. We've got the vertical towers with the fish tank at the bottom. You can see our salary is doing very well in there. And here we've got a small gravel bed that actually is we're growing some uh, baby jam in there. Then if you look at here, this is the second system where we've got our fish tank flowing through a biofilter and into the DWC. This system here does not have a biofilter. This gravel bed actually doubles up as a biofilter for our system. And that you also learn exactly what's the ratios and everything in the course. Um, and then our last hobby system basically is a long, nice DWC. And you guys can see this is actually very nice they're doing very well these are ready for harvesting this is about these are about 300 grams of lettuce heads you'll see here with the baby gem at the back they're actually starting to bolt which means we need to harvest great cool thanks carl uh, the one question coming in there on the verticals yes you you will see some verticals there uh, they are static, they don't rotate, um, but all the plants will have equal access to light. At the farm here in Midrand, we don't have a lot of verticals. That's because we've got a lot of space, uh, so we don't necessarily need to, to grow upwards. Our farm, uh, other farm, which is located on top of uh, Eastgate Shopping Center, there you will see we've got uh, a lot of vertical towers, and that is because space is very limited there. Uh, and so vertical growing does make more sense. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. But a well, very well-designed vertical tower it doesn't need to rotate. It can be static as long as all your, your plants are getting equal access to light. Okay, Jan, what does DWC stand for? Deep Water Culture. Uh, that's what it stands for. Essentially, it is growing plants on water uh, using rafts or polystyrene to hold the, the plants up, but the roots are fully submerged in a waterbed. So DWC is deep water culture. Um, another question on the airflow. Do you actually need to inject air in the water or is it done by the showers? So it is both. The showers do add extra oxygen to my water, they also help with the cooling of the water, um, but we do inject oxygen into the fish tanks. And I like to have the showers more as a backup oxygen source for the fish. And if the air pump breaks, the showers will continue to provide oxygen for the, the plants, uh, for the fish. We also inject air into the water, underneath the water beds, and that is because plants also need to breathe. They also need to have access uh, to, to the oxygen. 
Okay, Carl, I see you're showing us a mineralization tank. Yes, so uh, just there was one of the questions, uh, do we have a mineralization tank? Yes, we do. So the mineralization tank is completely separate from my aquaculture, which you will see there. Is This is where we actually capture, excuse my French, but the fish poo. And we capture it and go put it in there. And this is where our mineralization happens. And you will see this pipe on the left-hand side goes into the tunnel. And that's how we put our mineralized water back into the system. The reason why we're not taking from the bottom, because it can be that there is still solids lying at the bottom. So we don't want to take from the bottom and putting that solids into the system. We first want to break it apart and actually dilute it into the water. Yes. Cool. So uh, mineralization is basically extracting nutrients from the fish waste without blocking up your beds and your system. It's a very important part of any aquaponics setup. Okay, so we've got time uh, for a couple more questions. Um, then we're going to have to to wrap up. So please, if you've got any last last minute questions, drop them down. The question on do we have a moving bed biofilter? And uh, no, Francis, we don't. Our biofiltration is that both the the gravel beds as well as the Matala filter mat, which we find has worked the best in, in aquaponics uh, because we are able to remove fine particles as well as do the, the required biofiltration for that. Uh, Netsai, what's the setup for your filtration? Very simple. Um, water flows from our fish tanks. From the fish tanks goes to a solid capture filter and that solid capture filter removes the, the bulk of the fish waste. Uh, and then from there it goes through a biological filter, which also removes very fine particles, which, which happen to block up uh, roots and uh, media. And then it goes to the plants. So it's a very simple, very simple filtration system. But uh, also we've been through many different types and varieties and we found nothing that actually works better than using the Matala mat. Um, for that. How does a fish, fish hatchery work, Joe? Um, there is, it is completely separate to the aquaponics. Uh, we do have a hatchery here on the farm where we are breeding tilapia, but basically you have a mummy, you have a daddy, and depending on the type of fish, you either harvest the eggs or you allow those fish eggs to hatch in the tank. But basically you need at least one male and one female, uh, in order to produce eggs and have those eggs fertilized and grow the babies. But it is done separate to the main system. Philip, do you use organic fish food? Yes, we do. Uh, we do use organic fish food. There is a producer here in Johannesburg South that has been making organic food for the last couple of years, uh, which is great because for the first time we can use food that is traceable. Uh, you don't have to use organic fish food, uh, but we choose to purely because a lot of our clients want to know what our fish has been eating. Uh, Nikki, have you ever grown asparagus? So we don't have asparagus, but some of our clients are growing asparagus uh, in their systems. It does grow. It works especially well uh, on the media beds. Uh, uh, but asparagus is a bit of a tricky crop when it comes to a cash crop because of how long it takes to, to get to harvest and the yields, I, I do believe there are higher profit crops to grow, but if it's for your own consumption, then absolutely you can have asparagus. Okay, Ntebele, where do you join the full online course? Okay, I will drop that link uh, on here and also send it out to people afterwards. Uh, there we go. Okay, so just go to our website. Oh, thanks, Lola. Uh, and on the website, you can uh, just register. Just put in your details, sign up, and yeah, we will uh, hopefully continue. Okay, yes, sir. good question. Are we going to offer the 12-day course online? We will, um, but we are still a few months away. There's, there's a lot of recording that we have to get through for that. 
but in the next few months we will be offering our 12-day commercial course uh, option uh, to to join uh, to do that so this is obviously the first we will be launching a lot of other courses over time um, and make this information more available okay when do we need to join and pay uh, Pierre simply you can just drop me an email um, to, to join uh, obviously for for payments ideally before the course but if you struggling to pay or you can't afford it or you're having problems it's not going to stop you from joining we're not going to hold you you, you or, or, or you know push you out we'll definitely see what we can do to accommodate you so if you if you are struggling with payments uh, or you're struggling with cash at the moment it is very hard for a lot of people please 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 don't let that stop you from joining the course every course we do we always give away a number of seats for those who who genuinely are unable to to attend um, but but yes if you are struggling guys you've all got my email on the invite so please drop me a direct mail uh, anytime today or tomorrow uh, obviously the next session we'll have will be at 4 p.m. tomorrow and in that session we'll be going through the modules so the earlier you can get access to those modules the better so to give you time to watch the videos and go through the the various content All right, um, cool. Any other questions from, from anyone? Justin, just quickly, I see you missed a question there with what's the best way to remove nitrates and nitrites from aquaculture water and how do these high levels affect the growth beds? Yep. So just to quickly answer that, you do not want to get away, you don't want to throw away nitrates. Nitrates is what is good for your plants. That's the actual plant food um, that you require. That's the main, one of the main nutrients you want in your water. Nitrites, the second one, that is bad for your fish. And that is what is your nitrites is actually converted to what the first one is, is nitrates, which is the plant food. So if you're running a pure aquaculture, the only way to get rid of that is to do a water change. But because this is aquaponics and we've mixed them together, you get rid of your nitrites, of your nitrates by your plants growing it. So it won't affect your beds. Cool. Thanks for that. Carl. Okay. Uh, Andres, thanks very much. Farm is looking good. Uh, very much thanks to, to Carl and his team. Uh, who have done exceptionally well um, at, at keeping our farm running. Uh, and I will also, you know, just say at this time with the COVID-19, the entire farm have decided to quarantine themselves on the farm. And so all staff are actually living on site during the lockdown uh, to reduce any chance of problems coming in. So hopefully we shouldn't be uh, affected over the next few weeks. We're being very watchful with, with who is coming into contact with any of our produce. Uh, and so for other farmers, I would also highly recommend just to, to, to be extra cautious. Um, up to what module does the three-day course cover? Corbus, it covers all eight modules. So um, the three-day course is exactly the same as the five-day online course. Uh, in terms of content, so there's no modules missing um, on either of them. All right. Um, last chance for questions before we wrap up. Uh, any more questions? So yes, Corvus, the, the online course basically will run all week, Monday to Friday, uh, and next week we will start it again, Monday to Friday. Um, but also having said that, if you sign up for um, this course and for whatever reason you can't make a webinar, you can always join one of the following ones uh, the following weeks. 
All our sessions will be recorded. If you miss a live webinar, it will be made available on the portal um, on the same day after the webinar. So if you miss it, you can always catch it up. Um, but all the content is online. So you can work through that content at your own pace. The Q&A and learning sessions each day will be recorded, will be posted online, so don't have to worry about missing that. Um, but also, if, if you want to, you will be able to catch up on the, one of the following weeks for a specific lesson that maybe you, you really want to attend but couldn't. Uh, Nikki, have you done labs at all? Um, labs? Labs, labs. Um, I'm not sure what you are referring to. Um, our VAS. I'm still lost. The one in the ground. Are you referring to the hydroponic method of farming? Um, wicking systems. Yes, we do do wicking systems in the ground. Um, if that is what you are referring to, uh, which is a sub-irrigation method of, of hydroponics. So, but as for Alvis, that I haven't heard of. So the, the methods we use here, deep water culture, uh, ebb and flow or flood and drain, vertical farming, wicking, um, and a little bit of NFT. But uh, those are the methods that we'll be covering, covering in the course. Okay, but feel free guys to drop me an email if you have any questions or if you're struggling to sign up Please, please, please don't let it hold you back from joining us. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun through the week, and we're going to share loads of information. And uh, I have no doubt um, it's going to be, be good fun. Um, sand ponics. So I think I now know what you're referring to. Very, it doesn't work so well in aquaponics purely because sand is, is not a good uh, filter for microparticles of fish waste. It does block up very easily. You have to replace the sand. can be incredibly laborious. So uh, we do do a flow through with gravel, which we'll talk about. But um, yeah, I don't recommend the use of, of sand for, for growing. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you guys join us today. Uh, for our first session. Uh, Carl, thanks so much for, for being our reporter on the ground <laughs> in, in, in the line of fire. Um, Anytime. <laughs> and yeah, I look forward to for you yeah, on the, the days coming. So guys, glad you found it informative. Thanks, Thomas, Joe, and uh, Philip, and, and everyone for for your comments, uh, sign up if you want to sign up, drop us an email if there's a problem, um, and hopefully we'll chat and see you guys um, tomorrow. And Nikki, I will check on that link and I'll, I'll come back to you on it. Cool. Guys, stay safe. Um, and uh, yeah, hope, uh, hope you all have a great evening and we'll chat to you and see you guys tomorrow. Cool. Cheers. Cheers, guys.